Good afternoon! This is episode 8, and it's Halloween week, so I figured I'd introduce myself with a spooky little sound. We have a lot to cover today, so it's going to be a longer show, more than likely. First, let's start off with some more TV news. ABC could possibly be renewing Body of Proof for mid-season. Think maybe it's because half of their new shows were flops? CBS could possibly be renewing Unforgettable for a mid-season and is attempting to recreate the old show Charmed. NBC is bringing back the old favorite Murder, She Wrote starring Octavia Spencer instead of Angela Lansbury. And also, for those of you who like the show Drop Dead Diva, it has been renewed. I'm not sure what channel it's on. I believe it's Lifetime. And we have some sad news in TV land. Actress Marsha Wallace passed away on Friday at the age of 70. Although the exact cause of death was not determined, it was later classified as complications of breast cancer. Marsha Wallace is best known for playing witty secretary Carol Kester on The Bob Newhart Show. Most recently, she is known as the voice of Bart Simpson's teacher, Mrs. Crapapple, best known for the catchphrase, Ha! Rest in peace, Marsha. TV Land lost a good actress. So some interesting local news that has my attention and actually gets on my nerves. The first one, a local high school special needs student had his specialized iPad stolen, but will be receiving a new one courtesy of an anonymous donor. The iPad was stolen from a special needs student, Brandon O'Connor, who has Down syndrome, and he goes to Central High School. The device was stolen at school. And he uses this special iPad to communicate because he cannot talk normally. So he uses the iPad to communicate by typing or texting, and it comes out in a vocal format. And it tells the teachers when he needs to go to the bathroom and things like that. On Tuesday, an anonymous donor came forward and donated the money to get a new iPad specialized for his needs. We do have some good people left in the world. Next is another story that has me on edge. Local elementary school teacher has been a special needs student's mouth. A Jewish Street elementary school teacher was indicted for allegedly putting pepper and soap in a special education student's mouth. Court records show. Prosecutors said Donna Varney also flicked a book at the seven-year-old student while she was employed by the Manchester School District. Varney faces three counts of misdemeanor simple assault. She faces increased penalties because of the child's age. County Attorney Patricia LaFrance said the assaults took place over several months during the 2012-2013 school year. Superintendent Deborah Livingston said Varney is no longer employed by the district. Thank God. Both LaFrance and Livingston said they couldn't comment on how the allegations came to light. Varney will be arraigned at the Hillsborough County District Superior Court in the coming weeks. She could not be reached for comment. Go figure. Next, we have our usual Dancing with the Stars roundup. This was a very shocking week that showed high scores and a total shocker as to who went home. But first off, they kicked off the show with big news that next week, this coming Monday, Len Goodman, which is known as the Grouchy Judge, will be back in Britain for their version of Strictly Come Dancing. So once again, we will have a guest judge, and that guest judge will be Cher. Cher will also be performing her her new single on the show. So let's start off with the results. The first one that was up to dance was Elizabeth Berkley and Val Smirkovsky, and they had the quick step. Little, it was a little scattered at the beginning, but and it wasn't the best at the skipping movements, which the quick step is known for its fast hopping and skipping. 27 out of 30 was the score. Brandon Pita had the jive. Good effort. His kicks could afford to be a little bit better. Considering he's a guy, he should be kicking harder than that. 27 out of 30. 27 was the popular number that last night, which is good. That means they're all improving. 
There's nobody that stands out as a very bad dancer this season, which is good. Leah and Tony have the salsa really coming out of her shell, that Leah. She's really finally realizing, I think she had a turnaround point last week, where she finally realized that this can be fun and not always competitive and stressful. Uh, good moves and very few mistakes. A 26 out of 30, which is actually one point off of her normal score of 27. So she's still up there, though, which is good. Jack and Cheryl have the jive. Now, Jack and Cheryl had a very tough week this week. Uh, Jack's MS is catching up with him, and it's becoming to become a struggle with his symptoms acting up because of the strenuous activities of training. But he's dealing with it, and uh, it didn't stop him last night from the jive. Uh, very good movements, and still gave a very good performance, 27 out of 30. Amber and Derek had the pasta doble. Great dance, considering both of them had injuries come up this week. Uh, Amber, because of her size, is, is becoming to have knee problems. And Derek's old back injury acts up occasionally, and this week was a week when it acted up. Uh, but they had great rhythm, and 29 out of 30, they tied with another couple for the highest score. Bill and Emma had the quick step to an Elvis song, Viva Las Vegas, which fit him perfect because he was just performing in Vegas last week. A funny rehearsal, as usual. You know, Bill is a comedian, so all rehearsals are going to be funny. Uh, very good dance, 23 out of 30. He's definitely... Um, improving each week or staying the same. Uh, I prefer him to see a higher score than 24 or 23, but for his age and his, his skill level, that's a good score for him. Snooki and Sasha had the salsa. Movement was a little short and stiff, but good, not her best, 27 out of 30. And lastly, for the first round, Corbin and Karina had the cha-cha. Great movements, considering they had a rough patch as well. They were very unknown as to what they were going to do for this week's dance until Friday. So they only danced Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then performed last night. Whereas normal people start actually performing their dances or practicing extremely by Tuesday or Wednesday of the previous week. So they didn't really get a lot of practice in, but they still gave... A 29 out of 30 performance. Very, very good. And team, uh, round two, rather, was the team dances. And the way the team dances work is they're split into, obviously, two teams of four. And they all have to perform the same song. And basically, they dance as a group. It's the name group dance or team dance. And then they also have individual rounds. So the first, <laughs> the first group was called Team Spooky Bomb Bomb, and that included Leah and Tony, Elizabeth and Val, Bill and Emma, and Nicole and Sasha. They didn't know what to do with the theme of the dance, so Bill decided that since it was Halloween, they should do a Halloween theme with dead zombies. And it was actually kind of cool, because Bill was the cemetery groundsman, and all of these zombies came up out of his cemetery and spooked him. It was a really good dance, 27 out of 30. The judges loved it. They said it was very entertaining. The second team is Foxing Awesome and included the remaining four. Jack and Cheryl, Corbin and Karina, Brant and Peta, and Amber and Derek. My, both my sister and I think it was a very weird dance. It was disheveled and it felt like you were on an acid trip, as Carrie Ann and Naba said. However, they still managed to get a perfect score for that routine. The shocking, 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 shocking elimination was between Bill and Snooky, and Snooky went home. Now, for some of you that watch my show, you know that uh, Snooky has been a topic of conversation between me and friend for a while now. And he's obviously glad she's gone. I have to admit, I'm glad she's gone, too, because I feel like she was a contender, and it's good to get the contenders out of the way, because then the underdogs who deserve to win can have a chance. And I'd like to see the next person to be eliminated. I'd love to see Corbin go home, because Corbin is extremely uh, focused and extremely able to do everything that Karina gives him. 
And I think that's not fair to those that have to struggle a little bit, like Bill. I'd love to see Bill make it to the semis because I really think that he has a chance. And Emma's a very good teacher considering it's her first season ever being a professional. She's usually on the dance troupe this year. She's got her own partner, and she's, for her first shot, she's already on to week eight. Usually on your first season, you, you're eliminated very early, and she's surviving, so that tells you something. Next, we have um, Reel to Reel Review, which is my movie segment, and this week I rented from the library Celtic Thunder's DVD Storm. Loved it. Of course, I love anything by Celtic Thunder, but still... Celtic Thunder is an Irish musical group of all men. George Donaldson, Ryan Kelly, Keith Harkin, Neil Bryan, Emmett Cahill, and Colm Keegan are the current members. There was also a singer named Daniel Furlong, however, he had to leave due to the pressures of schoolwork. When Storm was recorded, Colm and Emmett were not yet members. They each replaced long-standing original members Damian McGinty, who had a spot on Glee for one season, and Paul Byram, who left the group to pursue his own musical avenues. Along with singing in the group, each of the remaining members is either working on or already released a solo album of their own. Ryan, which is my favorite, is already working on, his, on releasing his second. Storm is the group's first and so far only theatrical performance, meaning all of the songs pretty much go in order and a play is performed as part of the concert. Most of their concerts are just that, a concert, made up of individual routines as well as ensemble numbers. Storm has those qualities, but all of the songs are like a musical, instead of each singer singing a song they liked or wanted to cover. Storm tells the story of an ancient Irish tale, the Irish equal of our Romeo and Juliet. The group does an awesome job of mixing theater with music and makes it very enjoyable for the audience. Just because they haven't yet made another theater-based show doesn't mean they never will again. Currently, the group is in the middle of their 2013 tour, which is titled Mythology Slash Voyage 2, which plays until the second week of November. After that, the show becomes a split of Mythology Voyage 2 and Voyage 2, sorry, and Christmas music. Finishing their tour shortly before the beginning of December, so they can return to their native lands of Ireland and Scotland in time to spend Christmas with their loved ones. I went to their Heritage show in 2011 with my friend Martina, and they really put on an amazing show, regardless of the theme. They usually include every state on their tour, or at least the majority, so if they're in your area, I suggest you go, especially if you like Irish Celtic music. But even if you don't like that kind of music, it's a really good, they, they put on a great show. And they always make us laugh with some song. Like when we went there, there was a song they covered, which is on their current tour as well, called Seven Drunken Nights. And it's an old Irish tale song, but it's extremely funny. Like they actually act like they're drunk and they stumble on the stage and they, they catch each other. And it's just hilarious. Their website is www.celticthunder.ie, and you can sign up for their mailing list, read blogs from all the members, and keep an eye on their tour dates. Obviously, this year's tour is almost over for some of us. Uh, New Hampshire already had their visit in September, so unfortunately, I won't be going this year, but hopefully next year. I think they're out in the southern parts right now so if you're a southern watcher you may want to check your your local listings and see if they are in your area there's no restaurant review this week because i haven't had a chance to review any new restaurants but we do have a tv show re review chopped chopped is a cooking competition show on food network that normally airs on tuesdays at 10 p.m eastern time it is still on and yes i watch it every week so you're probably saying I thought it was supposed to be a show that you haven't seen before. Well, I look up shows on Hulu that I can't get on TV. Even though I get chopped on TV, I wanted to see what seasons they had. They had season four. Currently, the show is in season 17. The method of the game is there are three rounds, appetizer, entree, and dessert, each having a mystery basket filled with random items, usually four or five. 
in which the contestants must use all of them in that basket. They are allowed to add other ingredients as they see fit. The dishes are then judged by three judges that have restaurant or chef experiences. Popular judges included Amanda Freytag, Alex Garishelli, which is my favorite, Scott Conant, and Jeffrey Zakarian. It is hosted by Ted Allen. Like I said, it's currently in its 17th season, and Hulu has select episodes from season 4, which are really fun to watch and see how the judges have changed. Occasionally, they will have themes, such as all of the contestants are firefighters, or in the Army Navy, or even teenagers, was two weeks ago. They also occasionally do themes with the food. For example, one episode last season, they had to make all three courses using leftovers. Last week's episode featured foods you would find in a brunch. They also comply with the seasons and holidays by giving the contestants wacky items for Halloween, or only using the grill for a summer theme. If you love cooking or cooking shows, especially competitive game shows, I highly recommend Chopped. Next I have for you, since it is Halloween, this coming Thursday, I would be dressed up, but I couldn't think of anything to do, and I was supposed to get my hair cut, so I didn't do the braids, I mean the hippie long stocking theme that a friend suggested, but um, I'm dressed up as myself, that's a costume in itself. Since it's Halloween this week, I decided to include a Halloween segment on my show called Celebrity Ghost Stories. If you followed me from the beginning, you know Celebrity Ghost Stories is one of my favorite shows. Since Halloween is Thursday, Comcast put out a slideshow of 25 celebrities who have shared bits and pieces of their own experiences of the paranormal. I figured I would share pieces of their stories with you. If you also watch Celebrity Ghost Stories, a few of the stars and their stories may not surprise you, but a few you may be shocked to learn about. The first one is the most recent one, Olivia Newton-John. A man killed himself in her mansion last month, or the month before, depending on when Comcast made the slideshow, and she immediately called in a Catholic priest to bless the home and rid it of any negative spirit energy. As she was planning to sell the mansion and wanted the negative spirit energies to be gone, as it would ultimately bring down the amount of interested buyers and also probably the amount of money she could get for the house. One famous person who backed away from the deal because of its history was Rosie O'Donnell. Number two, singer and songwriter Keisha has had many experiences. She said she didn't know his name, but she clearly knew he was a ghost, and claims she is very open to the paranormal and his visits. She also confessed that she has another ghost that haunts her body, which according to her is more common than most people think. Ever popular actress and singer Miley Cyrus, as if her twerking wasn't enough, also had a ghost experience at a house she stayed in while in London by on a family vacation. The experience, she says, actually started with her younger sister, who was taking a shower, and the water changed completely to hot all by itself while her sister was in the shower. According to Miley, her sister actually had red, irritated skin from the water being so hot. Miley also claims to have seen a young boy sitting by the sink numerous times, watching her take a shower. I guess she won't be renting that house for a vacation again. X Factor judge and singer Demi Lovato is next. Her ghost encounter was gentle. A young girl dressed in 1800 styled clothing that lived in her closet. She also claims that she was caught once by her mother talking to a young girl she saw in a photograph. Is this the same girl? Number five is a celebrity ghost stories alumni, Regis Philbin. His story happened during the early days of his broadcasting career. He stayed alone at first at a hotel that was allegedly haunted. He also knew a friend who did that stuff, as he put it. And so they decided to go back a second time and spend the night there together, awaiting visits from these alleged ghosts. They were not disappointed. A woman continued to watch them as they sat in the living room. 
according to his friend, the ghost is that of the founder of the hotel. Actress Kate Hudson claims number six, and she claims to have seen ghosts on more than one occasion. Some of her experiences have been personal, such as her grandmother and from the unknown. One of her most memorable events, besides her grandmother, that was non-personal, was seeing the ghost of a woman with no face. Now that's creepy. Happy Halloween. Number seven. Uma Thurman and Ethan Hawke did not go into extreme details with Comcast about what they experienced, but they did say that they had to leave their Snyden's Landing, New York apartment because of extreme supernatural events. Actress Juliana Margulies has always believed in ghosts ever since an incident, an innocent afternoon with her sister. The two children were playing with the ever popular Ouija board, being typical experiment of children, when they immediately felt a presence in the room with them. She claims she hasn't touched the board since. Wise idea. Number nine is actor Tim Robbins who also didn't go into extreme details about his experience, but said that he once moved out of an apartment after only living there 24 hours because he sensed that ghosts already claimed and lived on the property. They were there first, after all. Actress Neve Campbell, ironically popular for her work in Scream, lives in her own haunted house. She learned a woman was murdered in the house she lives in. Friends have claimed to see the woman's ghost wandering the halls. Actor Nicholas Cage said that as a child he refused to sleep whenever he went for overnights at one of his uncle's houses because he claims to have seen a ghost in the attic. Ironically, the uncle himself, Francis Coppola, may have brought the haunting on himself due to his line of work. If you don't know who Francis Coppola is, I'd suggest you look him up. It's rather weird. Number 12 is also an alumni of celebrity ghost stories, Joan Rivers. Her ghost story stems from a move after a devastating year when she lost her job and her husband to suicide. One day when she came home to her old drawn-out New York apartment on a hot August night, no pun intended to Neil Diamond, to find her apartment ice cold. She also, to her alarm, found pornographic images and words drawn all over her walls. She brought it to the attention of the landlord and was told the story of a previous tenant who lived a rather provocative lifestyle, if you catch my drift. When her dog wouldn't even enter the apartment, she called in a voodoo priestess to eliminate the spirit. Now that's a ghost I wouldn't want to deal with. Number 13 is Ghostbuster Dan Aykroyd, who played on the movie Ghostbusters. He actually has a real ghost story of his own that he just can't bust. He believes his house is haunted by Mamas and the Puppets singer Cass Elliot. When asked why he assumes it's her response, it's her, his response is because you feel like the ghost is large in size. We all know Mama Cass was rather large. Occasionally, the ghost will climb into his bed, but the Stairmaster he owns has also turned on by itself, and things go flying across the room for no logical reason. Apparently, she's not happy. Number 14 is actress Taylor Momsen. She credits her mother for starting her belief in ghosts. When her mother was younger, she lived in Devil's Lake, North Dakota, with a neighbor who was also a friend. When the friend died and things given to a museum, Taylor and her mom went to go through some stuff in her house, and Taylor was able to see and talk with the friend, and how both it and her mother let go. Photographs revealed evidence of a ghost, a hand on a typewriter, and the entire body of the friend was seen in a window. Actor Matt McConaughey claims to live in a haunted house. He's even nicknamed his ghost Madame Blue. He claims they get along fine, and he has had no scary events take place in regards to the ghost. They've actually sort of become friends. Which happens if it's a friendly ghost. Sixteen. 
How I Met Your Mother star Allison Hannigan has had experiences too. She, along with a few stars in the list, believes that her home is haunted by a male spirit. She recalls being followed out of the house by the spirit, but jokes, saying at least it was a gentleman enough to let her go first. Here's a good way to look at it. Number 17 is well-known actor Hugh Grant, who joins the cast of I Have a Ghost in My House. Only this ghost is not as unnoticed. Grant constantly hears crying and screaming, and visitors to his home have also witnessed this. When asked if he knows who it is that is haunting his home, his response is the previous owner of the house, Betty Davis. Number 18, comedian Ana Gazier from Saturday Night Live shared her story on Celebrity Ghost Stories as well. Sorry if I pronounced her last name wrong or her first. Talking about when she played in the Broadway production of Wicked, which was set to play in the historic Oriental Theater. I'm assuming this is in New York, but I'm not sure. During costume changes, she claims to have seen a woman and two young children dressed in 1800s attire. At first glance, she thought they were audience members, but when she tried to follow them, they simply vanished. She talks to the director and learns of a fire in the theater years ago that killed over 600 people, many of which were families out for a show. In the actual episode, Anna breaks down in tears as she thinks of the extreme sadness the fire caused. Actor Charles Dutton is next, who calls himself a lover of death. So much so that his then-girlfriend at the time and himself decided to visit the grave of a voodoo princess, priestess, and then noticed a new grave, that of a man. But it was weird. The grave was dismantled, and the casket was actually visible. According to Dutton, you could even see parts of the skeleton and the cloth. Dutton tried to push the casket back to its normal position and left. As they were leaving, however, they suddenly felt as if it was no longer just the two of them and turned to find a scraggly old man with the same cloth seen on the skeleton. The man continued to stare at them both until Dutton watched him vanish into the night. Okie dokie. Number 20. Keanu Reeves claims to have seen a ghost in a double-breasted white outfit when he was young. His babysitter also confirmed what he saw. Doesn't sound like it was scary, just random. Number 21. Actress and singer Halle Berry had an experience while preparing for the Dorothy Danbridge movie she appeared in. While she was studying up on Dorothy for her part, she apparently stirred up the woman's spirit because the ghost started to appear. One night, as Hallie was getting ready for bed, the sounds of rustling plastic started coming from a dress she had to wear for the movie. No windows were open and nobody else was home. Mm-hmm. Number 22, musician Sting doesn't give any solid details about his experiences with ghosts other than he and his wife, Trudy, have experienced many things in their home, turning him into a believer of the paranormal, even though he can't begin to explain it logically. That's the point. Number 23, lead singer Belinda Carlisle shared two experiences she's had in her life. In the first, she levitated and had an out-of-body experience at the age of 17. In the second, A shape of mist hovered over her one night while she was trying to sleep. Number 24, Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney from the Beatles. (laughs) Swears that the ghost of his old friend and bandmate John Lennon visits periodically. Especially in 1995 when the remaining members of the group decided to record one of Lennon's songs. Experiences mentioned include strange noises and machines in the recording studio operating oddly. Last, but certainly not least, Jamie King recounts a day when she was at her uncle's house and saw a figure fly through the yard. Not sure what to make of it, she shrugs it off and forgets about it. Until later that night when she woke up and wanted to shut off a fan that was running too loud for her, 
but she couldn't move. She describes it as being glued to the mattress. She was unable to wake her boyfriend. Then she recalls hearing the sound of, of slapping, and her boyfriend's face or head began to jerk back and forth as if it was being slapped. Then the covers were torn away from them, and the spirit left. Creepy! So, now, now that you've heard some celebrity tales, in the spirit of Halloween, do you have any experiences to share? Feel free to comment either on YouTube or via Facebook. We'd love to hear from you. By Facebook, I mean if you're finding this video from my Facebook page, underneath the link, when, it, when I post the link, you can comment straight from there. You don't have to comment on YouTube if you don't have an account. Although I think it's fairly easy to make one, and it's free. And I don't really care if you don't post any videos, as long as you subscribe to mine, and then you'll get an email when a new episode airs. Next, we have our reflection corner with today's readings. The first reading comes from Romans 8, verses 18 to 25. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth complaining with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in travail together until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait for adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Today's psalm comes from 126 verses 1 to 6. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. He that goes forth weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. And today's gospel reading is from Luke chapter 13, verses 18 to 21. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like the grain of a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his garden. And it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nest in its branches. And again, he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like heaven, which a woman took and hid, leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Today's saint of the day is one that is extremely not known and it's very hard to actually pronounce. Saint Evaristus was a pope and he was born in Bethlehem. Evaristus was the son of a Greek cultured Jew in Bethlehem. He converted to Christianity and eventually went to Rome. While there, the new Christian impressed many in the church, and near the end of the first century, he was named Pope. An ancient history of the popes, Liber Pontificalis, Book of the Popes, states that Evaristus succeeded the martyred Pope Clement. This means Evaristus was probably the fifth Pope, following in the tradition of St. Peter. Other ancient sources, however, report that he was the sixth pope. 
He reigned as Pope for about eight or nine years. It was a dangerous time in history to be a Christian in Rome, where rulers were vicariously persecuting and killing church leaders. Helpful appointments. As Pope, Evaristus is said to have divided the heavily populated city into seven parishes and then appointed seven deacons to oversee the ministry. Reminiscent of the apostles who appointed seven deacons to help with the ministry in Jerusalem. Reference of Acts chapter 6. Although there are no existing reports about how he died, Evaristus is included on an ancient list of Christian martyrs. It is likely that he was martyred during one of the many Roman persecutions of Christians. Evaristus is said to have been buried on Vatican Hill, near the tomb of St. Peter in Rome. And how we can follow in Evaristus' footsteps. Evaristus, like many Christian leaders of his day, is among the martyrs who died because of their faith. One of the more famous Christian martyrs of the 1900s was American missionary Jim Elliott. A gifted writer, speaker, and teacher, Jim felt God's call to mission fields where people had never heard about Jesus. The young missionary decided to work among the fearsome Alca Indians in Ecuador, who were known for routinely killing strangers. Jim dropped gifts from a plane to befriend them. He went to visit them, insisting our orders are the gospel to every creature. Jim began to reach out to the Alca people, but on January 8, 1955, he and four men were killed by Alka warriors. Years later, some of the warriors who killed the men accepted Christ when Elliot's widow bravely returned to complete her husband's mission. Jim's story has inspired many to break through uncharted territory for Christ. And we'll close with a prayer. Dear Lord, I ask you to inspire us to reach out to strangers, to defend those in need, to console those who are hurting. Dear Father, I ask you to guide us as I befriend those around us, as we befriend those around us. I ask you to remind us to be gentle with words and sensitive in deeds. Dear God, let me be an example of honor and kindness, courage and character, all the days of our lives. We ask this in your name. Amen. And this week's fan of the week is Julie Bushnell. I chose Julie this week because she's a silent watcher but every week watches my show and comments through letters because we are pen pals. So, Julie, I hope you're watching this show. Congratulations, you're fan of the week. Now if we can only get you to start commenting on Facebook. See you next week.